Excellent singing. Uh, you may take a seat. I want to just welcome you to uh, Grace Bible Church tonight. This is a, uh, just a thrill for us as a church family. We love gathering on Good Friday to celebrate the death, and then of course we'll come back on Sunday and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and it's just sweet to see so many of our church family here, and if you're visiting family and you're joining us and you've never been here before, we're thrilled that you're here as well, and um, this is just a highlight for us. It's a highlight of our year because it's such a, a memorable, notable um, event. It's hard to imagine a more important event in the history of mankind than what we celebrate on Good Friday. Um, I want to ask you to uh, bow your heads and pray with me as we prepare to look at God's Word and prepare our hearts for communion tonight. Lord, we are so thankful for your power to save. If it were not for your son's work on the cross, there could be no salvation for sinners. We would be hopeless and helpless. We would be enslaved in our sin, buried under our guilt, unable to help ourselves, and there would be no one to look to for help because there would be no just provision. But because of Christ, because of your son, Because of your plan, Father, and because of the effective work of your Spirit, salvation is a reality. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you tonight for purchasing from every tribe, tongue, race, and nation souls. You purchased souls and you purchased our souls and we're overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed that we get to serve you. We're overwhelmed. We get to obey you. We're overwhelmed that your spirit takes up residence in our lives so that we can battle sin and walk in righteousness, so that we can actually give glory to your name even before you return, and we can know that we are in you because of the down payment of your spirit. Lord, all of this, all of this is because it's only possible because of what we celebrate on that, fr- that happened on that Friday so many years ago. So Lord, as we plan to take communion and, and to remember your death, your burial, your, your, your resurrection, and your return, I pray that you would turn our hearts to you in a profound way and that we would truly lose ourselves in the effectiveness and the profound sacrifice and the profound turmoil that you experienced on that night. In your name we pray this. Amen. Well, you all know that this is Good Friday. What's so good about it? You think about it. On this day, about 1989 years ago, give or take three years, Jesus Christ of Nazareth was falsely indicted on trumped-up charges In a kangaroo court of injustice before the Sanhedrin, he was denied justice before Pilate because of Pilate's spineless capitulation to the Jewish leaders. Pilate even said on on that day, You brought this man to me as one who incites people to rebellion, and behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges you make against him. Therefore, I will punish him and release him. (laughs) He finds no charges, so therefore I'm going to punish him. Jesus was then mocked and scourged. He was forced to carry his own cross to Golgotha outside the city. They hung him on a cross and he died there a shameful death of crucifixion, a notorious death, culturally offensive. And there he hung between two criminals. He was mocked by the Jewish leaders, the governor, the ruler of Galilee, and then at the cross by the Jewish leaders again, and by the criminals he was crucified next to, and then... To top it all off, random passerbyers who had no vested interest in his death. He was abandoned by all of his friends, his closest companions. And so in light of these facts, what is good about this Friday? I suppose we should admit there are many biblical ways to answer that question, but tonight we're going to find our answer in Luke 22. 
in Luke 22. And this is the text that I read. I wanted it in your mind as we, as we sang, as we worshiped our Lord and Savior together. And we're going to go back there and just take a few moments to prepare our hearts for communion. In Luke 22, verses 39 to 46, this is the story of what happened in Gethsemane. Gethsemane doesn't even occur in, the, in Luke's account, but obviously that's, you know, in, in the parallels we find the word Gethsemane. And Luke just tells us it happened on the Mount of Olives. And so as we dive into this story, I want to be holding in front of us that important question, why is this Friday so good? In verse 39, Luke writes, He came out and proceeded, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. This was his customary place where he would go to pray. And the disciples also followed him. Now, leaving the upper room, which would have been um, in Jerusalem proper, he would have crossed the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives. And Gethsemane is a garden full of olive trees um, on the western side of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a larger geographical, it's a mountain with both sides. In fact, he would spend his nights on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives, which is not properly the city of Jerusalem, but technically where the Gethsemane is would technically have been the city of Jerusalem. It would have been a short walk from the upper room, and he goes with his disciples, 11 of them at this point. And as we dive into this story, the way Luke tells it, it's pretty Pretty compelling that uh, in verse 40, he commands the disciples to pray. And then in verse 46, at the end of the story, he commands his disciples to pray and even rebukes them for not praying. In the next level of this story, in verse 41, he kneels for prayer. In verse 45, he rises from prayer. In verse 42, he prays. And in verse... 44, he is praying earnestly, in agony. And then between those two accounts of his fervent prayers, the record of being ministered to by angels. So as we work through this story, there's just a parallelism that's pretty profound as as Luke tells us that story, and it seems to be very deliberate. Let's just dive in, verse 40. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And this bookends the story. As you see in verse 46, when he comes back to them, he says, why are you sleeping? (laughs) Get up and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now, recording twice that Jesus told his disciples to pray not to enter into temptation is unique to Luke. Um, In the parallels of Matthew and Mark, uh, he tells them that after he returns, after the first time of praying, and it's interesting in Matthew 26, verse 40, it says that after the first time of praying, he, he, he had prayed for an hour. He says to them, can you not keep watch with me for one hour? And then he returns and prays again, comes back, they're sleeping, returns and prays again, comes back. And so he is going at it, and it, you know, I don't know, we, we wouldn't know, but it could have been three hours. He is pouring out his heart to his father, and he's telling his disciples, make sure that you're doing the same, pray so that you do not enter into temptation. And of course, from parallel accounts, we know that all the other disciples were there at the garden. He left eight at the edge of the garden. He took the three into the garden with him, and the three then are left a stone's throw. And verse 41 says, he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and then knelt down and began to pray. So he's following his own advice. We're already starting to see an answer to our question, why was this Friday so good? Because Jesus actually followed his own advice. He poured out his heart to his Father in prayer, and he did not succumb to temptation. He kneels down here, and he begins to pray, and in verse 42, he says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And this is an incredible prayer. This, I, I don't, I can't really say, that, I don't have any authority to say this, but it's hard not to think this perhaps could be the greatest prayer ever prayed. It's just so profound because of what's happening in Christ and because of his dependence on his Father. Jesus was facing temptation, and so he pours his heart out to his Father in this fashion. And I'm going to 
appeal a little bit here to the book of Hebrews. Just keep, you can just listen. Just keep, keep your, book, your Bible open to Luke, but just listen to Hebrews. And in two verses, the apostle who wrote the book of Hebrews is very clear to say that Jesus faced temptation and he succeeded. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was righteous. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus himself was tempted in what he suffered. And that's actually the grounds for why he can help us as our great high priest. He can help us because it's not foreign to him. The suffering and the temptation, he's experienced it. He's been there. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Christ was tempted, but he was without sin. And here at this moment of temptation, What is going on? Luke chapter 22, verse 42, he calls God as he as he always does, with the exception of one instance on the cross, he calls God the Father his Father. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And it's interesting that 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 conditional statement is a is a type of conditional statement that you know, in, in, the, in the original language, you would use this type of construction if you're going to say something like, let's just assume this is true. For the sake of the argument, let's just assume this is true. If you're willing, then take this away from me. Remove this cup. He's not saying that God will. He's not even saying that God could. He's saying if you're willing, let's assume that's true. If you're willing, then remove it from me. He's confessing to his father that his will is that he not take the cup. He immediately follows that up with two contradictory statements. Not not self-contradictory. It's just a contrast. Yet, maybe even stronger, however, however, not my will, but yours be done. This is such a profound moment in human history, let alone our Lord's life. I mean, this is just so profound. Christ is subjecting his will to his Father. His will differs from his Father's. We're going to talk about this in a second because this is so profound. We, we dare not imagine that, you know, I mean, this is an example for us. We have to learn obedience the way Christ did by subjecting our will to the Father. But when our will differs from the Father, it's because our will is fallen and our will is sinful. Christ's will is not. Christ's will is righteous. His will is perfect. How does it differ? Father, if you're willing to remove this cup, he he doesn't want the cup. Not because he's disobedient to his father. He loves his father. He does whatever his father tells him to do. Jesus Christ never disobeyed his father. Ever. He loves his father. He loves obedience. He has fullness of joy because he obeys his father's commands. That's not the problem. The answer comes in this word, cup. What's this cup? He says, remove this cup from me. This cup at least means a couple of things. First of all, this cup could just refer to his imminent death, his imminent demise. He's about to die because the father has told him this is the time, this is the way, and this is the means that you're going to die. And you can see it used that way in Matthew chapter 20. Listen to what Jesus says to the disciples about, and he uses the word cup. It's interesting. He uses the word cup here to talk about um, a a martyr's death. Um, In Matthew 20, the disciples are asking Jesus for favors. And uh, they're wanting to sit at, two of them are wanting to sit at his right hand and his left hand when he comes back in the kingdom. And so 
Jesus responds to this request to sit in the, at the throne right and the throne left. He, answer, he responds with this response. He says, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it's for those, who have been, for, those for whom it has been prepared by my father. So here's an example. Here's an instance where the cup would refer to dying a martyr's death. And he says that the disciples are going to follow him in his death in that fashion. But there's certainly, there's certainly more to this. This word cup has such a theological significance. And it certainly comes to play when it's on the lips of Jesus Christ before he dies. In the Old Testament, the cup has a long, rich heritage of being a term that refers to the wrath of God. The wrath of God. When Jesus says in verse 42, remove this cup from me, his, his death, it's not just any death. It's not just any old death. It's not just three hours of suffering. It's a death involving the satisfaction of his father's wrath against sin. Listen to Isaiah chapter 51, verse 17 and verses 21 and 22. Isaiah writes, rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling, you have drained to the dregs. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted, who are drunk but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, even your God who contends for his people, behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger, you will never drink it again. Here's a in response to a generation of Israel being punished with God's wrath, he's him saying, I'm going to take it out of your hands. In Ezekiel 23, verses 31 to 34, we read, You, speaking of Jerusalem or Judah, have walked in the way of your sister, which would have been Israel, the northern tribes. Therefore, I will give her cup into your hand. Thus says the Lord God, you will drink your sister's cup which is deep and wide. You will be laughed at and held in derision. It contains much. You will be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. You will drink it and drain it. Then you will gnaw its fragments and tear your breasts, for I have spoken, declares the Lord God. There's a cup for all the wicked of the earth. In Psalm 75, verses 7 through 8, we read this, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. For a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams. It is well mixed and he pours out of this. Surely all of the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. This is a cup of wrath for the wicked of the earth. Interestingly enough, in Jeremiah 25, we read another reference to the cup. In Jeremiah 25, we read, it's picking it up in verse 15, Jeremiah writes, For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me. To drink it. You fast forward to the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, John records If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship it, the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Two chapters later, the world's economic and religious system collapse. 
Revelation 16, 19. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Jesus knows what this cup is. He's not unaware. He's not ignorant. He knows exactly what eternity is going to look like. After all, he wrote Isaiah. Listen to this prophecy. Just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. They then... They will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. This is a description of God's judgment against sin. And Christ knows what that is. He knows what's in this cup. Of course, it's not surprising that he's staggering under the weight of what his father is asking him to do. Verse 43, it says, Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. We shouldn't be surprised. Here is the son of Abraham. And angels are ministering servants to the sons of Abraham, to those who will receive salvation. How much more the very seed of Abraham himself in his uh, greatest moment of need and Verse 44, being in agony, he was praying very fervently. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling upon the ground. He's having a tremendous psychosomatic symptom here. It's affecting his body. The turmoil of his soul is affecting his body. And he, as we learn from Matthew, is pouring out his heart to his father three times. The first time for an hour. What is this this agony? What's this turmoil? It's it's a distress. It's it's anguish. And it's producing this fervency in prayer. It's producing an intensity, uh, an eagerness, a constantness in prayer. Some might imagine, reading this story, that the intensity of what Jesus is experiencing is just simply the thought of what he's about to experience. Was Was it the fear of Pain? Was it the fear of death? Was it just weakness of humanity? Jesus was troubled. And he wasn't troubled by just fear of pain or even just physical death. Consider consider this for a second. Consider how many people have faced physical death with calm demeanor. Socrates drank hemlock with poise. Dietrich Bonhoeffer faced the noose with resolve. John Hooper was burned, silently going to the stake because they ordered him to be silent, merely smiling at his parishioners, praying for them before he was killed. Julius Caesar endured 20-plus stabbings at the meeting of the Senate on the Ides of March with no noise or visible fear. September 11th terrorists ended their lives with conviction. William Tyndale died without much concern for himself, but his last words were a prayer. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Thousands of noble men from our country gave their lives for a free world on June 6, 1944 in the assault on Normandy's beaches. Thomas More died calmly for a false gospel as a martyr for the Roman Catholic Church. And then here, when we see Christ in Gethsemane, and at the last few hours, we read in John 13, 21, he became troubled in spirit. We read of him in prophecy, 600 years before he lived, Isaiah 53, 11, anguish of soul. Matthew 26, 37, he was grieved and distressed. Mark 14, 34, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. 
And here in Luke twenty two forty four, he was in agony, praying fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. The only answer to this turmoil, to this differing element in his will, in verse 42, was that Jesus knew what was in that cup. One writer says this, The ineffable sorrow and anguish which gives rise to the request that what is approaching might pass from him is not fear of a dark fate, nor cringing before physical suffering and death, but the horror of one who lives by God at at being cast from him, at the judgment which delivers up the Holy One to the power of sin. Consider this, brother and sisters. Consider this, that Jesus' will differs from his Father for good and righteous reasons. Jesus, his will is righteous. He hates sin. His Father is asking him to be associated with sin. Second Corinthians 5. 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And here's Christ with a righteous will who loathes sin. He loves righteousness. And his father is saying, take all the sin that I would ever forgive and put it on your shoulders. And he's confessing in prayer. I don't don't necessarily want to do that, but you know what I want to do? I actually want to submit my will to your will. If you're willing, take this cup. But however, however, no. I, I will submit my will to your will. And Jesus also, not only is his will righteous, his will is pure. And he loves and cherishes his relationship with his father that he's had for eternity past. I mean, you, you think about your greatest earthly relationship. When you think about the warmth, the tenderness, the love, the confidence and the trust that exists in that relationship. And that doesn't even scratch the surface to what we're talking about here. The son of God praying to his father, thinking that his father is asking him not just to associate himself with sin, not just take sin upon his shoulders in a judicial sense to suffer for sins he never committed, but then to be abandoned by his father, the relational abandonment is profound because he's never experienced that. From eternity past, he has always and only enjoyed perfect intimacy with his father. His father says, behold, my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. I love this one because of who he is. He loves the rest of us because of who he is. He loves his son because of who his son is. And his son is staggering at this request and just says, that's, that's not, if there's another way, that, that'd be great. However, I will submit my will to your will. The struggle in here is not because there's some sort of wrinkle of hesitation and some sort of diso- temptation toward disobedience, disobedience as if he was just you know, longing for a way not to obey. He, he's, 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 the struggle here is very real. Because his will is righteous and pure. And he subjects himself to his father's will. Why is this Friday good? This Friday is good because in the garden, Jesus relied on his father for the sustaining grace to subject his own will to his father's will. He was answered. He was answered for this prayer so that the cup did not pass from him but instead he drank it down to the very dregs it's good friday because everyone who is in christ we are celebrating the triumph of our lord and savior who satisfied his father's wrath against all of our sins it's the best friday Because were it not for this act of atonement, this ransom, this 
price being paid to ransom our souls because we were guilty and we, were, we owed God an infinite debt we could never pay. A propitiation where Christ satisfied that wrath and took it away. If you're in Christ, your wrath, the wrath that you deserve has been satisfied and taken away. It was poured out on Christ because the cup didn't pass from him. Sinner, have you ever considered whether your guilt will be paid for by you or by Christ? Those are the only two options. And if you're, if you're sitting here tonight thinking about your soul and your guilt and what you owe God, I want you to, I want you to I'm going to read Psalm 49, verses 7 to, to 9, before we uh, take communion here in just a moment. In Psalm 49... Verses 7 to 9, it says, No man can by any means redeem his brother or give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of his soul is costly, and he should cease trying forever, that he should live on eternally, that he should not undergo decay. If a human were to atone for another human, you should give up even if you had eternity to do such a thing. Our guilt is too great. Christ was God, and he became man, and he actually died in the place of man, but he had a a quality of atonement that could actually atone for our sins in a matter of hours. And it's just profound to think this is why this Friday is so good. On the basis of this act, we have the righteousness of God.